Expect the best used car deals guaranteed. Visit arnoldclark.com. Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show, sponsored by Arnold Clark. Apologies, we're a little late on air. Technical hitch, but we're delighted to be here. Stevie Naismith, Alan Ruff and Tam Cowan here with us. Uh, there were obviously a few technical problems. Some people suggested maybe that we didn't want to come on air, Ruffy, because Celtic were battered out of the <laughs> Champions League. But no, no, we're more than, ha- we're more than happy to take, to take on board exactly what people have got to say about it because it is a contentious moment. We'll be talking about that. We'll be talking about Motherwell and Aberdeen in the Europa League. We will hear from Neil Lennon, a very unhappy Neil Lennon, at the performance last night of Celtic being knocked out by but uh, as ever there's one way to spin a bad result and that's to sign somebody the next day and Celtic have done just that they've signed uh, David Turnbull on a £3.25 million deal uh, from Motherwell Ruffy, what do you make of the signing first of all? Uh, It's a good signing I think we've already discussed that he's a young man uh, year on year before the injury he was going to become a top player in Scottish football I'm sure the Celtic fans would have preferred the signing to be a wee bit earlier and possibly could have contributed last night in the game at some stage Uh, so no it's a good move for the boy but you're right you know it just takes away the heartbreak for the the Celtic fans of the, the poor result last night yeah, um, I don't think it made a blind bit of difference, uh, Ruffy, uh, to be perfectly honest with you. That's not where the problems lay, but we'll discuss that in a moment. Here's what the Motherwell chairman had to say about the departure of David Turnbull. Um, and basically, uh, I think he goes with the best wishes. It is with mixed emotions that we've agreed to sell David Turnbull to Celtic. David leaves us for a fee nearly double our previous record transfer. He is the latest in a long line of players who have de- been developed with us. Our continued success in that area is a huge testament to our manager, Stephen Robinson, his coaching staff, our academy staff, and our scouting and recruitment department. The money we receive for David will allow us to build up the strategic reserve which helps secure and sustain us through such difficult and uncertain times. This is also an opportunity to invest in the infrastructure. We wish David every success for the future. He's a local boy who has supported the club all of his life and has given us many memorable moments on the pitch. His agreement to extend his contract is a testament to his integrity and in doing so, he secured the club's interests as well as his own. And Tam, I think that's the key uh, to this whole thing. David Turnbull signed an extension so that Muddle could get money. Absolutely, uh, first class job by David and I think the, the theme song for this transfer Peter is the, the hot chocolate classic everyone's a winner because Celtic have just got themselves a smashing player you could argue at a time when they really really need one uh, Motherwell have bagged the thick end of £3 million David Turnbull has set him and his family up for life Scotland have suddenly got a guy in the squad who will be absolutely buzzing. So I just think it's a great move for everyone. Uh, We knew it was going to happen. This was hardly a huge shock because we had the full dress rehearsal uh, for this last season, of course, until sadly David uh, failed his medical at Celtic. But I think we all knew it was basically on the cards. And for any of the uh, the, the, the cynics out there that the, the reckon that it's a big step up for David Turnbull, I'll, I'll remind them that he's moving from one Europa League club to another. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy with that line, Tom, because there'll be a few people who'll be hurting at the mere prospect of it. So let's cut to the chase. Celtic knocked out by Ferenc Farris. Um, I'm not going to hold back on this one. I thought Ferenc Farris should have been knocked out by Celtic. They just were um, a team that were there for the taking. Celtic should have scored two, three, four uh, from the chances that they had. But yet again, calamitous defending cost them dear. The first goal was an embarrassment. He'd so much time to score it. The second one is quite simply a lack of professionalism and how to deal with someone who's quicker than you 40 yards from Celtic's goal. And that means <coughs> that you, uh, if you know somebody's faster than you, Stevie Naismith, you send them right over onto the track uh, and make sure that with 15 minutes left, you're suddenly not chasing the game 2-1 down. Yeah, um, it's a bit deja vu from, from the clues result. Um, and it's a disastrous result all round. Um, on top of 
where we're at with a pandemic, no fans in the in the stadiums, every club suffering, and and this would have definitely not been in the thinking of of Celtic. But the goals they lose are a lack lack of professionalism because they the defence are probably not thinking they're going to have too many more chances. They're just thinking attack, 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 and in the end it's cost them. But it, this, especially the second goal, the defending. And I bring the goalkeeper into that as well. Was far from from what you would expect from a Celtic team. Yeah, uh, and you know I was there, Ruffy. I was watching the whole thing unfold. And again, uh, you can only you can only call it how you see it on the field. It's been abundantly clear they needed defenders. Um, Julian and Ayer think they're Franz Beckenbauer and you know and uh, Franco Baresi. They're not. Um, they need a learning curve. They need to go through a learning curve. Uh, El Hamed made the mistake. The goalkeeper, I thought, was poor for the for the eventual winner in the game. But the manager came in. He didn't mince his words. Um, we're going to hear from Neil Lenny Ruffy, but just one thing before we get to it. The manager says the buck stops with him. And he signed the strikers. He told us last night the two strikers were not fit. Now, he's been raving about Klamala being on fire worked so hard in pre-season. So how he's not fit, God only knows. The other one, a Yeti, who scored against Dundee United, you need goals. I would have put him on rather than go with midfielders <laughs> who you're hoping can lead the line. So that was the first thing. Secondary to that, off the back of that, you've got Odson Edward. He gave the strongest hint that he'd really know, you know whether he was going to be fit for the weekend. There was, there's something in the background, the way he answered the question <clears throat> about Edward that stuck with me. And I wonder about him. And let's not forget, Celtic are also in this situation because yet again, they cannot call in Lee Griffiths because he can't step up to the plate. So every time they've needed big strikers, they're not there, Ruffy. So before we hear from Neil Lennon, it's Celtic yet again, Groundhog Day, getting done in at the back with poor defenders <clears> and also not getting players stepping up to the plate that they needed to step up to the plate. And they signed the strikers in the first place. Yeah, yeah, I have to agree with, with most of what you've said there, and I'm sure the Celtic supporters were well as well. My, my biggest grievance is the way that Celtic gamble at the early part of this uh, tournament without getting the, the right players in at the right time. They've had long enough to get organised for this, but they seem to think the first couple of rounds, yeah, we'll just wait and see where we go. We'll, we'll bank some more money and then we'll go out and get somebody. That, that's proven in the last couple of years not to have happened, and it's happened again. And that will that will be a big big myth for a lot of the fans. You're right. It, I mean, Stevie might disagree with me here with the two strikers for for him to say the two of them are up, aren't up for speed. It's eight million pounds sitting on the bench. Why can you not play one of them for forty five minutes? Why not put one on for forty five minutes? And you can see he's going to burn out or whatever. And then you change it, and then you put another one on. I just can't understand why two of them are sitting there. They're fit. And that you said there, the Polish boy, he's been there for nearly nine months now. So I don't know how he's now up to speed. And you have to say, it doesn't matter. Either of these two would have been better than the selection of what was up front. Celtic created enough chances to win that game. And even with one of these strikers on, you would expect the quality that they have would have taken at least one or two of their chances. So that's a question that Neil will have to answer because he obviously had to fight the... Callum McGregor won in last year. So it's a really strange one for me that uh, to say that they're not up to speed. Yeah, Billy Hutchison says, here we go again. Nothing said about the other team playing well. Uh, Billy, we're giving you the facts here. The other team couldn't get the ball for the first five minutes. They scored a goal when Celtic stood off their play. He scored. They had a five-minute period in the first half and then nothing. Billy, if you want us to bum them up, you're sadly a miss. They had a big punt up the park in the second half, which was their only foray into Celtic's half, and they scored. So to suggest for one minute that we're not giving them the credit, they are a team who have gone away from home on seven occasions and been able to hit teams on the counter-attack. So Celtic that's, knew That's the biggest coming. thing, Peter. The biggest thing is their organisation. That is what they had over Celtic. I think every area of the pitch, quality-wise, they don't match up to Celtic, but they are well organised. I played against a Red Rob team 
for Everton and their organisation was the difference. And again, that showed last night. Yeah, Here, now, the, the, as if that wasn't enough, Neil Lennon comes in and, and uh, again, some people thought I'd made this up last night. Neil Lennon came in and we asked him three or four times to clarify what he was saying. And basically, the manager came in and said, some players, he didn't name them, some players had come in and said to him, if we don't get Champions League this season, we want away. We want to leave the club. So it's either Champions League or get us out of here. That's what he said. Listen to what the manager said after the, the, the game. I have no idea on that one. Um, there are some players who, you know, may want to leave and they've made that, you know, inroads into that over the past you know, six months or so. Um, so if they don't want to be here, then, you know, we'll have to do something about it. Now, at that point, we all started to look at each other. There are moments um, when you actually go in and a manager says something. I mean, Craig Levine was a master at it. He would like, throw a line out and you'd think, oh, wait a minute. Neil Lennon was asked again, are you telling me a player has come up to you or players and said, if there is no Champions League, we want out? And he said, yes, Tam, I'm gobsmacked by that. Yeah, and the immediate thing I'm thinking, uh, Celtic play Mullerwell on Sunday. I'm already dying to see what the Celtic starting lineup is going to be. Um, in the back of what Neil Lennon is saying last night, it would sound as if he's had enough of certain players. Um, he's clearly uh, more than just hinted there uh, that some of them want to leave, and I think he's stunned. So. The Celtic starting lineup against Mullerbo is going to be absolutely fascinating. I'm sure the I'm sure the Celtic fans can't wait. But one of them, the guy you mentioned as well, Peter Lee Griffiths, I think in some respects, um, you know, the Celtic fans could just about handle uh, Lee Griffiths when it was during the the long, if you like, close season there, and it was all the issues about his fitness and about whether he was getting the finger out or not. Celtic fans were willing and able to put up with that maybe when there were no immediate games on the horizon but you're absolutely right the bottom line was if he had uh, been fit if he would have been playing last night against the hungarians in a game which celtic i believe created 26 or 28 goal scoring opportunities you would need to fancy a, a, a fit and inform lee griffiths to have easily put away two or three of them so he's an absolutely huge uh, lost just now and it's coming back to haunt the club Yeah, here's the reaction from Neil Lennon to saying goodbye to what is effectively, minimum a £30 million pound transfer kitty You know, for, for all everyone associated with the club it's massively disappointing and to go out so early as well and like I said, you know, I thought we were by far the better team you know, we had done a lot of work on Fern Varos and um, you know, I thought we would have a, a stiffer time of it you know, I thought we were, we had the game, um, yeah, they scored, no problem, plenty of time to get back, we do get it back and then you were in control to the point where I'm about to bring a jetty on, because we're in control, we've got given 15-20 minutes and we concede a really poor goal, but that happens in football, but it shouldn't, you know, it's a basic mistake and it's not even as if we're caught out of position, because we're in the right position to deal with it. Yeah, um, I'm... My apologies, I said transfer kitty, £30 million pound reward, Ruffy, um, for the Champions League. That kitty, gone. Yeah, it's a massive blow. I, I think everybody will know that every club at the beginning of the season sits down and the board of directors will discuss you know, budgets and protected money that's coming into the club. And that certainly would have been in a, a sheet somewhere. And knowing that they've had it before and what they've done with it and, and what they can invest and everything. So it's a massive blow because already we already know the Europa Cup isn't it's a one or two million shot if you have a have a good run. So it's a it's a huge dent in the budget and that's the thing that'll be worrying the Celtic supporters because they'll now be saying to themselves, Well, do we not need to recover that by obviously the main striker leaving, uh, which will be a massive blow in, in the scale of things. But we're not letting throwing that out, and Stevie will tell you, once you throw something like that out there, then people start looking at themselves, you know, because he's not named names. So we're all guessing now. Everybody will be guessing, who is it? Is it Cham? Is it, obviously, we know Roderick's going out the window. So it's a guessing game now. 
and uh, unfortunately, the biggest guessing game is the striker. And if it is him, then obviously he'll be out the door. But I can't believe that Neil Lennon's saying it was six months ago he was told that players wanted to leave if they weren't in the Champions League. I can't believe they're still there, to tell you the truth. Yeah, I, I mean, the other thing about this, and, and let's not forget about this, Stephen, up until a couple of years ago, if Celtic had lost this game, they were out. That was it. They've got to look forward to at least being in the draw for the Europa League. Yeah, they will. I think uh, the way Celtic have been in control domestically over the years, a big draw for players is that they'll have a run in Europe. Um, last season in Europa, they looked very good. Uh, but on the back of that, they're coming into this season hoping and sl probably slightly expecting that they'll be going further in the, in, in the Champions League. Um, so they have still got that to fall back on. But again, the players that are unhappy, it just they are now going to 100% be kind of looking at all their options and arguably the only one within the squad that has a right to potentially say, right, I, I would like to move is Edward for, for what he's done. The rest of them, it's probably, they're at much as fault as anybody else. Yeah, and it'll be interesting to see uh, who eventually uh, departs before that window closes on October 5th. And of course, you have to have willing clubs that want to buy them in the first place. That's the, the other aspect of this. Um, I, I must admit, and, and I may be proved wrong, and I'm, I'm willing to hold my hand up here, Tam. I would be gobsmacked if I thought a Scottish player had the arrogance in that lineup or in that squad to say, by the way, if I don't get Champions League, I'm off. I think you've got to look and sell. It, all, all of it points towards the likes of an Eduard and an Cham who have those ambitions to make the stepping stone. Ayer and Julian as well who want to make the stepping stone. I think some of the, the nonsense of AC Milan interested in Ayer has affected his head. Yeah, well, apart from anything else, Peter, if there was any of those guys who were saying if we don't get the Champions League, I'm off. If there were any of those in the starting lineup last night, they should be absolutely ashamed of themselves because the best way for any team to get into the Champions League is for the players to put on a performance that is solely down to themselves. So I don't know how many of them who came out with that line to Neil Lennon were maybe sitting in the stand last night, but if there were any of them on the pitch, then they clearly didn't do enough uh, to get anywhere near the Champions League. And maybe they are exactly the guys now that Neil Lennon will need to flush out of the club. Um, you know, but even get back to the David Turnbull thing, though, Peter, in finance, I, I, I'm, I would look into my crystal ball there and say that as much as it's great Mullow getting three million just now, I envisage that maybe 18 months, two years down the line, if we get a 10% sell-on clause, that Mullow will may even get another three million, because I can see this boy going to Celtic and being picked up very, very soon by a top, top side in the English Premier League. I think he's got it all. Um, when he first burst into the team at Mullow, he reminded me, uh, going back to 85, when we lost a young Gary McAllister to Leicester City. Uh, I think he's got the same kind of play as McAllister. He's got a lot of guile. Um, the, the old thing that they say about in snooker, that players think three shots ahead, but they always said that Stephen Henry thought six shots ahead. That's what made him so good. I think it's a bit like that when it comes to the pass for David Turnbull. He's maybe hitting six passes ahead when others are thinking three. I just think he's got it. I think we're going to get more money um, out of him a year, maybe two years down the line when he does get a big, big move. So I know it's scant maybe consolation to the Celtic fans just now who are obviously hurting after that exit last night, but they've definitely won a watch for David Turnbull. Yeah, Can I just um, add to that? Just, yeah. Can I just add to that? See for him to come back from such a big injury to the level that he's playing at from before so quickly shows his character. That's one of the toughest things to do. But he's come in this season and uh, you wouldn't realise he's had such a big injury. Yeah. I mean, that's... Even, we're not only talking about this season when he has been dynamite, but when he did make his comeback last season um, against the Marin midweek game, he came on for the last 20 minutes to an absolutely brilliant ovation for the Motherwell fans, of course. And even in that 20 minutes, consider everything that had happened to him, both physically and don't forget mentally, because he's a young boy who nearly, nearly, nearly had signed a deal 
Uh, you know, last season it would have made him a fortune and take, taken him to Celtic then. But he came on for that last 20 minutes against St Mirren and he immediately looked head and shoulders above everybody on the park. So, as I say, there's no doubt Celtic have won a watch here. Yep, um, we'll wait to see um, how well he progresses at Celtic and of course I think most of the messages we're getting uh, coming in on the Facebook uh, are basically wanting to know who the players are, you know, what type of player will come up and demand that, that there is a change. Um, you know, in attitude. Players are much, much stronger and they want to know uh, where their career is going and, and they want to try and, uh, at best, to orchestrate it and, and try and, you know, get the pathway to wherever they want to go. Um, but uh, I think that's something that uh, Neil Lennon certainly last night suggested, that it's something that he, his words, something that's been bugging him for quite a while. So clearly it rankled with him when players approached him and said, look, if there's no Champions League, we are off. Um, interesting times. Lots of people coming through um, and mentioning it. And as ever with a passionate subject like this, you have lots of fans who are absolutely delighted Celtic have been um, knocked out of the Champions League, which is great. That's the banter of it all. We all love that. Um, and of course, there are some people who are happy that Celtic uh, are on this 10 in a row bandwagon. And I don't know about you, but um, if that's the ambition, fine. Um, you have a right to think that way um, but European football at the Champions League end is not happening Celtic at best are a Europa League side at best um, now um, just, to, just to kind of confirm that we had a look at the 2017 team that made the Champions League group stages um, and the 2020 side that couldn't get past the second round one of the earliest times they'd been knocked out So there you have it. There it is, uh, Ruffy. That was the team uh, that was there for Celtic um, uh, for the Champions League 2020-2021. Um, and of course, if you go back the way um, to Brendan Rodgers' side, it's, it's, it's not too many changes, but I'll come back to that in a minute because um, clearly um, we're still looking for the other graphic, which was from 2017. But uh, nevertheless, lots of Celtic fans commenting on it anyway. Now, uh, from Celtic, we're going to switch our attention because there are two massive games tonight for the other clubs who are in the Europa League. And on right and proper, Tam mentioned them. Uh, one of them is Motherwell. Tam, I, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm slightly worried. I, I really want Motherwell to somehow find a bit of form. Yeah, um, and right away, Peter, if there's a wee positive, Motherwell can take out a last night. Um, that, that Celtic defeat last night and the performance is kind of how we've been performing this season domestically. Celtic last night, I believe, had 70%, maybe more, possession. As I said earlier, they created a heart full of chances, but they weren't just putting them away. They only scored one goal, and that has been the story of our season so far is... Uh, Stevie Robinson said last week we had 70% um, possession against Hamilton Ackies last week when we lost 1-0. As he says, that's kind of old firm stuff. That's how you expect Celtic to keep the ball when they're at Parkade or Rangers when they're at Ibrox. And we enjoyed that possession, but the, the absolute end product wasn't there. So we need to beware of any sucker punch tonight as well because, you know, Glen Afton, it's an absolute uh, no-lose situation for them. They're coming to Fir Park. It's a big occasion uh, for them. It is European football. And I'm sure they'll come out and Stevie Naismith mentioned it with Ferenc Varos. Uh, they'll be very well organised as well, I dare say. Um, so Motherwell won't be, you know, we won't be counting our chickens with this one, that's for sure. We've got absolutely no right. We've only won one game since January, which seems absolutely quite incredible for a team that finished third last season and now is enjoying European football. So, no, this this will be a tricky one tonight, but I'm, I'm, I'm quietly confident that not only can we win the night, Peter, but then maybe the season can start clicking into place. Um, I'll tell you, Stevie, I don't know about you, but if Glenn Afton walk out onto the park of Motherwell, I think they can win. I think they can win if it's <laughs> Glenn Afton. <laughs> it, was, it was looking at Ruffy there as I was speaking. Ruffy to me is still synonymous with Glenn Afton. 
Yeah, bro, look at his look at his mm-hmm. face. He's raging. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, apart from anything else, <laughs> yeah, you're you're, you're absolutely right. Um, Glenn Torren. What about Glenn Torren? Let's have a look and see what they're all about. Our reporter Gabriel Anthony has he's been looking at them. Glenn Torren finished fifth in the Northern Irish Division, but qualified for the Europa League thanks to a cup win. One of the oldest clubs still in existence, they were formed in 1882 and are managed by Mick McDermott whilst playing at the Oval in Belfast. One of the most successful teams in the country, the Glens boast 23 league titles, although none in the last 10 years, and they have the same amount of cups. This European campaign is their first in five years and they pipped Faroe side Torshavin 1-0 last week. Their domestic league has not started yet, meaning they've only played once this month, so Motherwell will hope to prey on their lack of game time. Uh, I'm not accepting any excuses on this one, Stephen. I think Motherwell should have enough in reserve. If if Glenn Torren were to win, we we'd we'd have headlines the next day talking about we're, we're nothing but we're worse than the Irish League. I mean, no disrespect to the Irish, but I think you know we can't slip any lower, can we? No, exactly. I think um, I think normally what these teams do have ahead of you is that they've had a lot more games. And the VT there, you see they've not had many games, which is the kind of roles reversed. But now, with Mullow not picking up many wins, their performances have actually been pretty good. They've had a f- dominating the ball. They're very comfortable on the ball as a team. So I fully expect them to kind of go through. Yeah, it's a, it's a strange one, um, Ruffy, because you, you need the final third. You need that edge. I think that's what they've been missing. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was the same last year with St Mirren. St Mirren were playing particularly well and not getting the ball in the back of the net and they ended up second bottom in the league for a, a long, long time and then they started scoring goals and they, they moved up a wee bit. So I think it's the same with Motherwell. I think they just need a rub of the green. They need some of their new strikers to come in just to get the confidence of hitting the back of the net. And, and it, as, as Tam was saying, this could be the night that all these chances they're creating will hit the back of the net and let's hope so. Yeah, um, listen, um, just before we get to uh, Tam on this one, um, here's what um, Stephen Robinson had to say about hoping this could be the night if they can get a win that they can start to look more positively at the domestic season as well. Certainly, yeah. Um, we're five games into the season. As I say, I don't bring up stats from 20 years ago. Uh, this is this team, this squad of players. We haven't won in five games and we need to turn that around and we will do. And as, as you've just rightly pointed out, a win in Europe absolutely kickstarts our season because we're missing a, a very small amount of stuff. Some of the stuff has been very, very good. There's been a lot of creativity. Just that six-yard box where we haven't had enough numbers, where we maybe haven't had the final quality or that little bit of nice. And... Are you, do you agree with him on that, Tom? Yeah, I do. Um, it's been very frustrating because the bottom line as well is, Peter, I'm not, I mean, there, 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 there may be a lot of Celtic fans today, Peter, uh, you know, I've been a wee bit slight disingenuous, maybe looking back at last night's game, and maybe when the starting lineup was revealed, they thought, oh, aye, that's good enough to beat Serge Varos, you know. Um, Motherwell fans this season, we've not had a single quibble when the, when the team lineup was announced. We've looked at it and we thought, wow, that looks really, really strong. Ask any Motherwell fan and they'll struggle to tell you the last time a bench was as strong. Ordinarily, you've got a couple of boys in the bench who, when they go for their warm-up, you know, Veteran season ticket holders would struggle to name who these kids are, but it's you know it's household names almost that they've got on the bench now. So I don't think we've had any complaints about the starting lineup about the personnel in the team. It's just a matter of trying to put the ball in the back of the net. Um, and my, my only fear tonight, Peter, is a, a, a wee reminder here. And Celtic obviously found that out last night. It is only one leg, and even though we are playing this wee team from Northern Ireland. A few years ago, we also played a very wee team from Wales called Lanethley, and they beat us 1-0 in our home game. OK, it was played at New Broomfield, but it was still a home tie. If something like that happens again, you don't get the, the chance to redeem yourself, as we did when we went down to Wales and won 3-0 that time. You look back at Celtic, if it had finished you know, 1-0 to Lincoln Red Imps or Gibraltar, whatever they were called, uh, when Brendan Rodgers had only just taken charge. Uh, I think what a huge result in world football that would have been. So, a wee timely reminder maybe tonight to the Motherwell players that 
get out there and do the business because uh, you're not going to get two shots at this one. Yeah, it's a good point you make, Tom. Stevie, have you ever been involved in a game where um, you're expected to win and, and you lose and it's a huge embarrassment? Unfortunately, yeah. Uh, the first one that springs to mind is we played Malmo in a qualifier um, and we went down to 10 men and, and then and that night, which again is something that could happen, is the left back step forward and, and hits a shot for 35 yards which is in the top corner and it's the boy's probably never had a straight line in his life but these are the things that happen in one-off games and that's why we've spoke about the Champions League being so entertaining the one-off games this is effectively the same kind of format that whatever can happen in the 90 minutes there's no way back if it if it goes wrong yeah uh, I mean I wouldn't be embarrassed by Malmo at least they have a European pedigree Stephen was that with uh, was that Rangers uh, that at Rangers yeah but to be honest yeah, at the I time remember it. at the time they were they were not given a chance and probably to us to an extent took them took it for granted that we we would get through the tie but unfortunately we didn't yeah, absolutely. And uh, did you and eight of your mates from the team all go out for a bevy after the game when you'd lost? No, we asked the manager in the Champions League, so, so we decided we wanted yeah. to leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Just, just checking. I mean, minor technicality. It couldn't happen in Scottish football, could it? Um, okay, uh, talking of which, Aberdeen are in action. Uh, nice little segue there. Um, Aberdeen are in action against Runovic. Ruffy, um, just before that, give me your prediction, Ruffy, for Motherwell. I think 3 nothing. What do you think? Uh, I, I would go 3 nothing as well. And uh, if the big boy, I think if the big boy White's playing, he'll get his, his goal that he deserves if he's playing. Okay, Stevie? 2 nothing, Motherwell. Yeah. Uh, Tom, uh, nil nil? Nil nil, and we went on <laughs> penalties. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, uh, right. Um, Runovic, Ruffy, if this is not a cricket score, I'm not having it. I mean, Aberdeen have had a good start once they've, now that they've eventually started their season. Um, They've got the wins. I say they've had a good start. I watched the Aberdeen Livingston first 45 minutes, and I will never get that 45 minutes back in my life. It was rank rotten, um, and and that's me being kind to it. Um, but I, I think they've got a batter, Rinovic. Yeah, I'm sure they'd like to batter uh, Rinovic, but uh, I think he would settle for three nothing. I, I really do. I think it's just a win and move on. I think all the bad publicity is sort of dying away now. So let's concentrate on the actual game itself. And if they were to win five or six, I'm sure he'd be happy with it. But I'm sure it's just looking to the next round for, for him. Yeah, um, Stevie, you may not be aware of this, but uh, just to enlighten you all, and you've got to try and not react under any circumstances. Uh, Ruffy has his own language where he just pronounces what he thinks he hears or he just makes up a name. Uh, everybody's got to actually look as if nothing's happened and you just continue on. It's, um, there, is, there is actually, a, there is actually a, a couple of letters that you stick after the back of his name, Tom, that sums up the problem that he has. I don't know, I don't know what it is, Tom, but he, he just makes up his own language. Rudovic could be a good team. Well, you know what, Peter? The good thing is I got it, I got it seriously wrong earlier with Glenn Torrin and Glenn Aston, but you were all you were all inclusive. I don't know if Stephen A. Smith's laughing at you could get Glenn Aston to die on But I'm delighted to say, and I, I know Ruffy will be delighted as well. I actually got a text when it happened. It's an all inclusive show. A text from the secretary of Glen Afton Football Club. Delighted for the mention on the football show. So there we go. <laughs> That's good enough for me. Um, anyway, apart from anything else, <laughs> Rudovic, Rudovic, whoever they are, Tom. You never had a Rudovic. Never, never had a Rudovic yeah. Kennedy. Yes, I have actually. <laughs> but, uh, but, but I'm going. I'm going for five nothing Aberdeen, Tom. Uh, I'm going double figures. I think Aberdeen will win ten nil tonight. Ten nil. That's good, Stevie. For a bit of balance and and reality. Uh, five or six Aberdeen at the weekend second half were 
starting to get into the groove, so I think they'll comfortably win. Yeah, Ruffy? I'm sticking at three. Three now. Three, you're going for three. Okay, here's a wee insight into them from our reporter, Gabriel Antoniazzi. NSI Runovic qualified for the Europa League through a third place finish in the Ashton <coughs> last season. Formed in 1957, they are managed by Glenn Stahl and play at the Runovic Stadium in front of just 2,000 fans. Their best spell came in the 2000s when they lifted one league title and three Faroese Cups. It is Runovic's sixth straight campaign in the Europa League qualifying and although they've never made it to the group stages, they did ease past Welsh side Barrytown 5-1 in the last round. This season they sit fourth in the table after 17 games have been beaten three times in the last five games, so Aberdeen will be confident tonight. Don't I'm, I'm, your changing, on that. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm changing my prediction to 2 0. I didn't know they'd beaten Barry Town. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well done, Ruffy. Uh, anyway, uh, Alan Johnson says Glen Torrent to give Motherwell a run for their money. Alan, you know. Strange things happen, I have to tell you. Kevin McSorley says, Hi, Peter. What's your thoughts on Lenin? Lenin throwing the players under the bus? Surely has to take full responsibility for these defeats in Europe. Uh, Kevin, if you're at the press conference last night, Neil Lennon said the buck stops with me. He picks the side. He knows it. He, he absolutely knows it. Managers have, um, you know, down through the years, highlighted players and their misgivings when he tells them what to do out in the park and they don't do it but he came in and he, he did not shirk responsibility on it um, certainly gutted but the buck stops with Neil Lennon and his decisions two strikers that they paid money for on the bench never started uh, and he played with Ryan Christie with three behind trying to support with obviously McGregor and Brown behind them and then of course um, the Keystone Cops in the back four um, now Morelos back at the moment, still there, back in action apparently, uh, available for the match at the weekend against Hamilton Ackies. Um, suddenly it looked as if there was a disgruntled player, Stevie Naismith, and then there's a player who's just saying, wait a minute, I need to, uh, if I'm going to get myself out of here, I've got to work my ticket. For him, from the player's point of view, that's what he should have done for the off. Just <coughs> If the transfer happens, it happens, but... I think as well with Rangers signing two other strikers, for me he's not going to come straight back into the fold. He'll just need to you know, bide his time. And but the whole process of it, I think for everybody involved, them moving on sooner rather than later will help everybody. Yeah, it's a, it's one of those things, Ruffy. I don't think there's a day gone by we've not mentioned him. I mean, he's been at the centre of everything. Yeah, he certainly has, but I think uh, Rangers manager would have had him in his office and told him exactly where he stands and in, in, in no uncertain terms, you know, and I'm, I'm sure he's reassured them, look, if we get the money for you, I don't want you here, you're out of here, you're a disruptive influence in the whole team, so you better buckle down, and, and while you're here, you, you have to perform to the level that we expect you at, and if he's got any sense at all, you know, he will. But unfortunately, there's a lot of them out there don't seem to have that sense that uh, they do their own thing. So we'll, we'll wait and see what kind of reaction there is. As Stevie said there, he'll probably be on the bench. Uh, but it just shows you the, the, the make of some people, you know, how they react to this situation. I mean, the boys get everything in front of him. You know, the, the, the move and, and, and everything that goes with it. I, I just can't get my head around why he would down tools. I really don't. Yeah, um, strange times, uh, Morelos. The saga goes on. Um, I was through in Edinburgh today at Tyne Castle. They were unveiling Andrew McKinley as the chief executive and Budge was speaking. Um, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind, uh, having spoken to her at great length, uh, you'll be able to get as many of the clips on the interview on plzsoccer.com, on our Facebook and our Twitter throughout uh, the evening. But Anne Budge clearly still feeling the pain Still calling for change, Tam, um, but I think she was trying to stay positive to me, suggesting that, you know, there still needs to be change, but she certainly wasn't happy with the way the whole thing went on, be it the the training, which Stevie obviously had to suffer from, which came back to haunt them uh, after the Premiership, below the Premiership, all training was stopped. Um, over and above that, the arbitration, the penalty that was handed out, uh, and of course, the vote that suddenly relegated them with uh, all those games to go. I, I think she was trying to hold back as much as she could 
and saying exactly what she thought of some people and their conduct. Yeah, you, you think, I mean, what else can happen to Hearts in 2020, Peter? I mean, we've we've been singing for the same hymn sheet about this since day one. It was an absolute farce uh, to relegate Hearts in the back of a season that wasn't played to a conclusion. And we really, really tried to shout and fight the corner for Partick Thistle as well. Uh, but there comes a point, I think now, maybe Ann Budge, maybe Hearts, Stephen A. Smith there, have just got uh, to, if you like, be galvanised but everything that's happened uh, to the club and make sure they get right back out of that division. That abridged division, only 27 games. Hearts will make you off to a flyer as well, as I'm sure Stevie appreciates. There's some decent teams in there uh, when they don't need to go the whole haul of 30-odd games when it is only 27. Uh, then they're going to have to get the points in the board early doors and make sure that they do come right back up uh, next year. It still, for me, absolutely stinks. As I said on this programme, as I've said on the radio, Peter, I would have happily stood up and coped for Hearts of Partick Thistle. And, uh, you know, uh, in the back of everything that's happened to them, I thought it was ridiculous. But I think we're at the time now, Hearts are trying to be as positive as they can. I think the, the fellow McKinley's come in as a good appointment for the club. And Budge says there's no way she's moving. No, she's there to keep fighting for the Jambos. And uh, I, I really hope the Hearts can get right back up next season, and I'm not just saying that for Stevie sitting there. The whole thing was an utter farce, a shambles. Yeah, and the one element that came through when I was chatting to her, Stephen, and I, I, I actually, uh, I, I like her. I've got a lot of time for her. I like the way she runs the club. Um, the one element that came through was okay. We're going to take her medicine. Um, we still want change because this is not healthy. It's not just about hearts. There needs to be change. Um, but she did say that, you know, through the foundation of hearts and their contribution, Andrew's expertise coming in, the rich benefactors that have hearts at their core, um, they are going to be able to bounce back. Elliot Freer has just been signed from Motherwell. Undoubtedly, a few other players will come in to really strengthen, to give you and your teammates the chance to get back uh, one season out. Yeah, everything Tam said there is definitely what I believe. Um, and, and just touching on when the managers came in and he has made the point to say, look, we need to be as one group and use that as motivation. Um, the club have been second to none in terms of the preparation going forward and trying to show their intent, I think, coming back, putting the testing in place. And that's why the frustration was there a couple of weeks ago with the not being allowed to train because... They are serious about, like you say, taking their medicine, working hard, and with a shorter season, coming out fast and and playing the way the manager wants and picking up point after points and, and building that momentum. That's that's the common goal for everybody at the club. And um, I think there is a lot of problems in Scottish football, but that, that that's a bigger picture for, for a long time ahead. I can't see much changing in the short term, but... As a club, we are just kind of pushing forward and and doing what we can that's in front of us, and that's first one in the league and getting promotion. Yeah, I think she's looking at Andrew as an ally who can take the heat off uh, a number of jobs that she was doing, maybe share the responsibility. Uh, and, of course, her expectations for her new chief executive, uh, she's hoping he can adopt the same type of attitude and fight the same type of fight um, that uh, Peter Lowell does as the chief executive at Celtic. I think if you look at what people are saying is going to happen in, to, to European football and the opportunities that hopefully that will present, I think we have to be there to be able to um, to be involved fully. In <coughs> and the implications, and as you say, to fight fight the corner of um, of hearts. So. Yes, that's one of the reasons I was keen to have Andrew. Not the only one, but um, it's a big part of it because it's a part of the future. That's big shoes to fill um, if you're talking about Peter's shoes. But, you know, I've worked closely with um, with Peter over, over, over the period. I was on the PGB at, at Hamden at the same time as Peter was and, and when Peter was on the board there. And he's someone that I, um, yeah, I... I, I I admire the way the way he works, and um, definitely, if I can be someone like him and can bring the level of influence to Scottish football that he does, that would be uh, that would be fantastic.
And Ruffy, that's exactly what Hearts need. Yeah. That's what lots of clubs need. They need yeah. somebody who will fight their corner. Um, because I think yeah. the one thing that came through from Man Budge is European football is changing and Hearts don't want to be left behind. No, I, I think that's good. You know, I think that uh, if you've got somebody at the club that's on these boards, the foreign boards, you know exactly what's happening. It's not fed down the line. You're there, you're in the meeting. You know the way which the which way it's going, and we keep hearing about all the Europeans trying to go one way, and and, and other people try force it another way. So, if you've got a vote you, uh, in any of these meetings, it can always help. But I think it's always good that Hearts are a massive club. I think Hearts are a massive club, and they should have people making decisions. I know I don't want to start going down the divisions that people are on boards. It shouldn't be or anything like that. But certainly. Somebody at Hearts, being a massive club, should have a, have a say at, at, at big level. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know my feelings on it. I've backed them since day one. Uh, long before we had Stephen on this show, by the way, in case anybody makes an accusation that we are mm -hmm. somehow uh, great pals. Um, uh, the other thing I was going to say, and, and, and it's only due to the fact that it's come through in a day like today, which is a very contentious day because you have, when you have Celtic and Rangers fans coming together, um, you do get a lot of good banter, but you do get a lot of people who come on our programme. And I apologise to some of the people who've had to read some of the stuff um, that's come up on it. Ryan McKinley, this isn't the show for you. Um, you were dragged up. It's as simple as that. Um, you know, go into a forum on a gutter area and, and post there and apologise to people. We've had to read some of the stuff uh, that's come up on our feed on our Facebook. There are thoroughly decent fans who can comment on the fact that uh, Celtic have been knocked out of Europe and give their informed opinion on it. There are Rangers fans who can give their informed opinion on it. But some people leave... Um, leave a lot to be desired. It really makes you wonder how they were brought up. Uh, anyway, apart from anything else, one thing before we go, and it's Stevie. Um, are you are you disappointed about the Scotland situation with the squad, or have you had a chat with Steve Clark to say, look, you know, once you guys get back playing, you, you'll be involved. He seemed to suggest to me that you guys are so old in the tooth that you know what's expected when you're called in. Yeah, that's it. The manager's been clear with that. Um... And if I'm honest, I, from a personal point of view, me going away with the lack of training and, and more so games would just be detrimental to me. I, I would go away and not do myself any justice in terms of being at the level of the rest of the boys. So uh, I fully understand the manager's point of view and, 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 and on top of that, his thoughts on me as a player and what I, he thinks I can bring. So I'm firmly just focused on getting to his fit as I can and then the next squad that comes up hopefully I've done enough for uh, in that time to be involved but um, no I fully understand and, and managing myself and, and everybody else are definitely on the same page Yeah and you, you did have a chat with them with regards to the squad <coughs> coming out Not in the past week but before when the situation uh, or, or when things were clear that there wasn't going to be many games and things like that and then I touched base last week with the head of the kind of sports science medical department and and just kind of gave him an update of what I'd been doing and stuff. But that that all comes into it now. The, the data and the, the training loads are all already available and, and sent to the SFA for them to, to analyse and, and see who has been training and at what level. So there isn't any hiding place. So you're, in terms of just being straight up and honest, and I'm old enough to know that I wouldn't have done myself any justice. Yeah, uh, Ruffy, that's the last thing I think, um, possibly yourself and the rest of the 1978, 82 or 86 World Cup squad would have needed is that kind of forensic covering of what you were doing. I mean, that would have been a, yeah. that would have been a nightmare, Ruffy. It would have been horrendous if they'd started taking alcohol and they'd <laughs> been a shocker. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Tom. Tom, this is this is this is just too much. Knowing when they've trained, where they are, you know what they're doing. That's just too much. I, I, I still maintain that if the video camera phone had been invented in 1978, uh, Alan Ruff would have did one cap and one cap only. And 
<laughs> yeah, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe two caps. But to, to be fair, if Ruffy and I'm, I'm trying, I'm urging him as we speak, and I have been for eight years for Ruffy to release his second autobiography, which would be absolutely blistering to tell you the truth. And so many, <laughs> uh, look at Tom. So many players, Tom, <laughs> would have to really, would have to really move to another country. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Stephen. Have you have you written oh. your um have you written your book yet? No, and I don't think I will. I'm I'm too boring. <laughs> I'll tell you there'll be a few good stories in there. Let me tell you, um, absolutely. Uh, but nevertheless, can I just ask you this? Are you the type of person who will absolutely make yourself available for Scotland until you you know? until they decide uh, enough is enough. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I think uh, short term, uh, you've got a Euros at the end of next season for, for any player that's got any aspirations of, of being in the national team, that's got to be your drive. And, and it's no different for me. I probably uh, appreciate it slightly more now that I have missed so many, um, or missed so many opportunities. So it's definitely a drive for me. And all I can do is get fit play well and hopefully make the score yeah fingers crossed listen apologies to everyone for uh, just uh, coming on a wee bit later but uh, well uh, worth the chat well worth um, reading out uh, quite a lot of uh, what I would say are the positive messages and of course critical messages as well of the performance of Celtic last night there are Celtic fans who are clearly not happy with manager certainly not happy with the players that we still don't know their names who said no Champions League we don't want to play here. Um, that's certainly something that I think will rankle with a, a number of Celtic fans. Uh, they went out because they couldn't defend. It's the same old problem. Uh, and we discussed it. And everyone on the panel has offered an opinion on it um, with, uh, uh, again, their honest opinion. And over and above that, we're looking forward to tonight's games. Uh, I think, Tam, uh, Aberdeen and Motherwell, we wish every one of them uh, the very best of luck to have a good game and do Scotland proud. We need something to lift the spirits. Yeah, absolutely. And if Mother and Aberdeen can get through the night, and you need to say, there's just a, there's as many Celtic fans, maybe except now, Peter, that Celtic maybe are a Europa League team. Uh, they clearly don't look cut out to make any real proper inroads into the Champions League. So there's, you know, uh, three representatives in the Europa League, and Rangers have got games to come as well. So, you know, you never know. Uh, maybe one of them, two of them, could break through and get into the leagues, and that would be terrific. Yeah, uh, I leave you with this thought. I don't want to upset the team. We've got a great camaraderie, a great spirit. We've managed to to, to sign Stevie uh, on the team, and he's been a great addition. Um, he does the odd little bit of subbing for the BBC as well as Tam does. We like that. We don't mind that. That's called a it's called a loan deal. He he has fun, enjoys the show here, and and then goes over to the BBC uh, for David Dimbleby stuff that he chats about with them. Um, but uh, Stevie, uh, the 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 big problem is. There's, a, there's going to be a staff party coming up. We are just hoping that all this nonsense, the coronavirus and everything's behind us so that you can legally come to that staff party because that will really kind of a, strike a bond with us. I mean, I, I presume you're hoping for that as well. Definitely. Um, to see you guys letting your hair down, so to speak, will be <laughs> some sight, I think, hopefully. Learn a few yeah, tricks for us. Yeah. yeah. Oh well. Have, yeah. <laughs> have, you, have you have you have you told them it's in Barbados? <laughs> I was just about to say. Yeah. Yeah. De Stevie, we fly out on the Monday and we sneak back in on the Tuesday. <laughs> it's as simple as that. Nobody will know. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the other thing I was going to say to you, I must apologise, Tam. Um, we were going to have a wee night out on Sunday uh, with Ruffy, but Ruffy's got better things to do with other people that he likes to hang about with, Tam. So it's just me, you and Hugh socially distancing. I know, but that's fine. But Ruffy, give her, give her our regards anyway. Ha, 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 ha,
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Keep going, you better than that. Uh, listen, uh, thanks, <laughs> thanks to everyone uh, for uh, their comments on YouTube and Facebook. Like, share, and follow if you can on our Facebook channel. And of course, if you can, hit the subscribe button on the YouTube channel as well. Thanks to everyone for the great figures. The figures have come in, uh, and the people watching the show is through the roof across YouTube and Facebook. We're absolutely delighted with it. And coming up next week, we will reveal to you our special campaign, which means we'll be giving away some prizes that I think you really um, will like to get your hands on. And hopefully we can entice uh, Stevie, Charlie, and the rest of the boys out, Tam and Ruffy, um, to actually show you how you can win these prizes at the special event. That's all I'm going to tease you with at the moment. To everyone for watching the show, from Tam, Stevie, and from Alan up and myself, Peter Marston, have a great night. Expect the best used car deals guaranteed. Visit Arnold Clark